Uh, so today's subject, herpetology. My purpose today is not to make you a herpetologist when you leave here. Uh, that's a little bit too much to expect. My goal basically will be to give you information. Um, yes, it'll be some scientific information, hopefully it'll be some interesting information. And since my understanding is that your reason for being here is that you want to be dozens and volunteers, and I assume most of you will want to lead a group, whether it's adults or students, I uh, want you to have enough information so that you can give them that information, pass it on to them. Uh, again, you don't have to know every detail. Nobody knows everything. So that takes a lot of pressure off if you go in with that knowledge ahead of time and with that thought. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to give you some ideas as to what you can talk about when you go out on the trail with regard to, with regard to uh, reptiles and amphibians, which are the herbs. Uh, of herpetology. On a day like today, you won't see any reptiles, uh, unless you have a turtle out there somewhere. Uh, might find some amphibians, but we'll talk about soon why that is, if you don't already have an idea, um, and what you can perhaps expect to see on the trails on a typical day, depending upon that particular day's weather, or the climate. So first of all, um, I was going to do some writing on here, and I still will, but I'm not sure how it's going to look. <laughs> My handwriting was never great anyway, but it was always legible. So now we'll see if anything falls, feels, uh, comes true to be legible. Um, herpetology. Herp herpetology, anything that is an allergy is the study of. I always tell the students that too, whether it's biology, study of two things, plants and animals, or, or sociology, Anything that is an allergy is a study of something. In this case, it's the study of herbs. Well, that's a little worse than usual so far. <laughs> and it'll get worse as I go, so I want to warn you ahead of time. Uh, take advantage of the early hour, you can read the letters. Okay, herbs. Technically, it comes from the Greek, Greek herpetan, which means crawly, creeping or crawling things. Not necessarily creepy, we don't want to convey that message, but creeping. Uh, little difference there. So creeping or crawling things, animals in this case. Uh, so that's how they're described because basically we don't have any reptiles that truly fly. We don't have any amphibians that fly. We have reptile that will glide, but nothing that flies. Not anymore. So creeping or crawling things, that's herpetology. Now herpetology involves the two classes of of vertebrates, which are, what did I mention, one of the two? Reptiles. Reptiles and amphibians, right. So, first of all, one of the things I should do is, is tell you, give you the information on, as I do in my mammals class for Eden Canyon, what makes, in this case, a reptile or an amphibian, an reptile or amphibian. Obviously, there are some things that put it into this category. Now, first of all, there are five classes of invertebrates. Vertebrates, not invertebrates. Five classes of vertebrates, animals with backbones and spines, internal skeletons. And in the order they believe that they evolved are the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and then mammals, far beyond. So, this is the order they've evolved. Now the fish, we don't talk about fish much in Eaton Canyon because the only fish we have are mosquito fish in the pond they put there to keep the mosquito population down. Um, and occasionally a trout goes over the waterfall, maybe travel several inches long or something, but other than that, we don't have fish in Eaton Canyon, so we don't talk about them much. But fish, obviously, were restricted to the water. They had to stay in the oceans and other bodies of water. They still are for the most part. Most fish have to stay on land. Then the amphibians came along and they were able to go out on land. They were the first animals, and of course, I wasn't there so I can't confirm this, but <laughs> the story is that these were the first animals to come out of the water and, just, and have a whole new area open to them for food and, and family and everything, the land. Now, they still had to stay near the water, it was important for them. They had to live, but they were able to get out on land some of the time. 
And that's where the anthid, the boat, comes in, the prefix amphibian, uh, boat, water and land, amphibian. So now I know for a fact that they came out on land 230 million and 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I know because Mickey Long, who's a great scientist, biologist, who knows, he doesn't like to video, but he knows almost everything, um, but Eden Canyon, he gave a class and he said that they came out about came out 230 million years ago and that was in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's 230 million, 11 years. Very nice. Approximately. <laughs> so the amphibians came out on the land. Then they developed into reptiles, which were able to stay on the land. Um, now I'll go into more detail on this as we go, but just to give you an overview of how this how this came about. And then from the reptiles, then the birds came along and all of a sudden they had another new world open to them. They could fly and go into the sky. And then mammals, of course, evolved from that. So, by the way, which classes have you had so far? Any? This is the first oh, animal class. Yeah. First animal class. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. So what I would like to do is just kind of give you an idea of where the herps uh, appear on the on the taxonomy uh, table list, and not taxonomy, taxonomy. Uh, so there are five, well, let me do it this way. Okay, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Every living thing is divided up into these categories. Uh, some, some there are sub subcategories. They have subphylum and superorders and suborders and subspecies and things like that. But these are the six, seven, seven main categories in uh, taxonomy. So the kingdom uh, for herbs, the reptiles and amphibians. What would that be? Anybody know? Animals or um, animalia, animals. animals. Well, in this case, for the herbs, it's just the animals. It's just animals. Yeah. So animals here, and then we have the phylum, which are the the corda, the chordates, with the nodal cord or spinal cord, and then the subphylum, the vertebrates, and then we come to class. Now, class is the next one down, and in the vertebrates, there are five classes of animals. And those are the ones I mentioned here, far again. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals are the five classes of vertebrates. <coughs> and you can remember that, I, I was using this in my mammals class, but you can remember that as being mammals being in, in the class because you're having a class on you have a class on birds, you're having a class on mammals, a class on probably not fish, I don't know, but you know the uh, But you also have amphibians and reptiles. So, that's where the class comes in. That's that's where those divide up from one another. And this is this is where after this is where the amphibians and reptiles split off. So, but they do fit into the same class. I mean, they, they are in the level class. So, these are the five classes of invertebrates: fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So, just so you know, this is where they split off from one another. After this, they're all in they're all in class vertebrates. Vertebrates. But after that, then they start dividing off into other, other orders here, orders and family genus of species. Now, Linnaeus came up, with, came up with what's called the binomial nomenclature, and that just means every animal and plant, every living thing, is classified all the way down, but known by two names, the genus of species. And of course, if they have subspecies and things like that, or hybrids, but genus and species. And amazing as it may seem, all animals and plants have different genera and species. Genera is the plural. Different genus names and species names. So you cannot have two exactly the same. For example, you can have the Apis mellifera as the honeybee, Apis mellifera. But the Salvia mellifera is the black sage. Same genus, the same species name, but different genus. And there are two birds, one's an Oseoanus and the other's an Aceoanus. Uh, 
Yes. It's just the opposite. But they're not exactly the same. The genus and species never change around. So the important thing to remember there is what I'm reading into here is you might see a western fence lizard and say, oh, there's a western fence lizard. But somebody else may say, I thought that was a blue belly lizard. Well, it is. It, is. it could also be a great basin lizard, I mean, similar thing. Um, so, using scientific names, Scalopterus occidentalis, you know what it is. If somebody <laughs> says, <laughs> well, maybe you don't at the moment, but, but if you know it's a Scalopterus occidentalis, then you know that it can be called a blue belly lizard, it can be called, some people call it a, a western basin lizard, I think, or great basin lizard, and western fence lizard is what we call them here most of the time. But at least you know that what that is. And it, it doesn't matter if you're in Russia, you're in China, if they know the scientific names, it's going to be the same animal if they have it. But you'll be talking about the same animal. So that's the problem with common names. On the other hand, it's much easier to identify and associate with a common name. Because how many people are going to go out and say, you know, there's a, there's a Canis leg trans or, or you know, there's a Bufus worm. Uh, not going to do that generally. So we do use the common names. Okay, so here, Chuck. Yeah, we don't have an eraser, but we have this. So okay. well, I'd kind of like to write like, clear, but can't you like a paper towel one? This is good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a okay, so what makes a hurt a hurt? Uh, first of all, anybody want to well, I have to put it up for grabs here. Who wants to give me one thing that makes them? Characteristics of both reptiles and amphibians to start, and then we'll separate them. So that's one. Ectothermic? Yeah, yeah. And, we, and that's another thing where we sometimes say cold blooded, and I'll show you later how that could be a real misnomer. But ecto meaning outside, outer, and then therm meaning heat. Of the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, how many of those are ectothermic? Any idea? All the birds and mammals are ectothermic. Yeah, first three. Fish, amphibians, and reptiles, ectothermic. And the birds and mammals are, what's the other term? Endothermic. Endothermic, yeah, correct. So that's pretty good. Both birds, both reptiles and amphibians are ectothermic. What else? They have scales. They have scales. Can't do it for both. Can't do that for both. We'll split them up later on the basis of that. Uh, they don't bear up live young. If they, have, they lay eggs, essentially. Can't do it that way either. No, no can't do that. No, not on the basis of eggs versus live. Can't do that. But that's the way we're here. And if you already knew all the answers, I could go home and go back to bed. <laughs> I knew all the answers I'm curious about too. I don't know all of them, so be prepared for that. But, uh, no, we can't group them together by, by a type of bird. Um, Does their skeletal system matter at all? One more thing. Does their skeletal system matter at all? Scales, you said? Skeletal <laughs> system. Skeleton. Yeah. Skeleton system. I probably heard um, No, no, that's really not particularly useful at this point. <coughs> well, I mean, they're different shapes, of course. Different, different skeleton in a, a lizard than in a human, but, but I don't think that's it. One thing you can think of in terms of what they don't have, both of them. There are two things they don't have that, that's at least one of these, two of these five classes of vertebrates do have, but don't they have? Body hair? They don't have hair? Feathers. And they don't have feathers. Yep, that's correct. <coughs> Gee, I'm glad I don't want to go more leather than I'm falling over. <laughs> no hair or feathers. Okay. Uh, anything else that sets them apart? Are they all nocturnal? No. 
You know what? I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Anything, anything you want to venture or ask, nothing is too dumb or stupid or or I appreciate. I appreciate everything you do. So. Somebody dropped me a line about a heart. <laughs> <laughs> about a heart? Yes. Well, actually, that's where I'm going here. Okay. The next one. Um, <laughs> with one exception, or one group of exceptions, mm -hmm. um, they have three chambered hearts. You can see this is going to take up most of the class time. <laughs> <laughs> Any shortcuts I could take. Who is the exception? Uh, the crocodilians, alligators. Uh, crocodiles, gharials, uh, caimans, they have four chambered hearts. And it's not really exactly why, um, but I've tried to find out. I've asked other people, nobody seems to know the exact answer to why they're hearts. <laughs> but it's been successful for them. And it, it may have to do with the way they capture their prey and using up the energy and Pulling the breath underwater, I don't know, but other animals can do that too. So I'm not sure the exact reason or not. And I will, I will do quickly. Uh, the human heart has four chambers. Uh, the two atria, atrium and cellular, the two atria and the two ventricles. Uh, but a, a reptile's heart, with the exception of the crocodilians, is more. That's almost heart shaped too, but but uh, they have two atria but only one ventricle. So the blood gets mixed together, the oxygenated, and it doesn't oxygenate as well as human blood does, or the, or the birds and mammals, or the, maybe the crocodilians. But they have, they have a uh, two atria and one ventricle, and so the blood does get mixed together, and it doesn't quite oxygenate quite as well as perhaps the mammals do. But hey, it's worked for millions and millions of years, 230 million or 11 years. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, then you have the, uh, the, the uh, artery coming out. I only did that because now, to me, it looks like a drawing of a mouse. <laughs> Not a man, though. That's right. Like a Peter's mouse. <laughs> Could be an eight foot too. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I guess that's a mouse part. <laughs> That's not a yeah, somebody said acorn too, and it doesn't look like a little bit like an acorn also. Okay, so three chambered hearts. Um, they're all active. We already have ectothermic. Um, let me see what else is there. Um, they, those are the main ones, the big three, really. Those are the important ones. Uh, okay, if I think of another one, because there are some that aren't quite as important like mammals. Uh, mammals have uh, non-nucleic red blood cells, but you know, it's a little hard to tell that in the field. <laughs> yes. So some things are technically correct, but totally useless. Uh, so, or, well, to us. Anyway. But now let's talk about the differences between reptiles and amphibians, because there are some. Now we can talk about some of the things we mentioned earlier. Let's do... Uh, I think, well, maybe it's better to just put them both on the same line. One has it, one has it. Uh, what's one difference between reptiles and amphibians? Amphibians start out, so I say, almost like fish underwater, and then they migrate their land. Their lifestyle. Yeah, they don't always go all the way out the land, or permanently on the land. I think of frogs. Yeah, yeah, frogs in particular. They do go through a lot of tadpoles and and such, yeah. And most most of the herds, the amphibians do that. Reptiles aren't really. They're born pretty much the way they look as adults, just a little tinier. Uh, but that that is sort of true. But I'm going to I'm going to skip it just because we have some that are more striking differences. Uh, anybody else? Okay. One is that reptiles. Put three letters there. Have scales. So you can assume, because I did that, that the amphibians don't, and there wouldn't be a difference. <coughs> so 
but they have sort of scales that we don't know. So reptiles have scales, amphibians don't have smooth scales. Reptiles can be out on land and, and have dry, they have dry skin for the most part. Dry. They can live on dry land. Amphibians have to be near water. They have to have moisture because they breathe partly through their skin. So we'll talk a little bit more about that too. In fact, I'll tell you right now. If you had a pet frog and you had a pet king snake or, or boa and you went away on vacation and they both got out, if you were gone a week, week and a half, you know, frog would be probably dead. It must have found your toilet or your sink that had water in it. The snake would be fine. It would be snake food. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's very important for, for amphibians to be moist. They have to either be in water or nearby where they can keep their skins moist. They have specialized blood vessels underneath your skin to take in oxygen that way. Some of them also breathe air, and most of them have gills, but some of them also do gulp air. For example, we'll see a video later of California Newt gulping air. So they do get air that way sometimes too, oxygen. But that's one difference between them, dry versus wet. You can think of it that way. Um, and another big one here, reptiles, I'll do another quote. Uh, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, my fingers in the way. Fingers longer than the chalk. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tape it to it. My fingers are longer than anyway, but that was worse. <laughs> Reptiles can have claws. Sorry. There you go. I'm going to try to this anyway. <laughs> Reptiles have claws, and amphibians don't have claws. Even the African clawed frog, as opposed to claw rings, clawed frog doesn't have claws really. They're just hardened. Uh, keratin material on their on their toes that, that they can use like claws, but they're not technically claws. Uh, so reptiles have claws; they also have to be dry. And that doesn't mean reptiles can't go in water, of course. The water snake and the water lizards. Yeah. What about snakes? What about yeah. snakes? What about yeah. them? They don't wear their claws. <laughs> That's a very good that's a very good point. I neglected to say those who have legs have claws. Those four legs are that's pretty good. Excellent. I appreciate that's that. Must have legs. Must have legs. <laughs> <laughs> they have the claws right here. No, that's a good point. I, I left out four important words. Those that have legs have claws. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Well they put alligators in the Amphibians into uh, we're, we're, I mean, they've got scales. But yet they live in the water. On amphibians, they've got a little bit of both features. In this case, as is the case with turtles, they're not amphibians. No, they're amphibious adjective. Mm. So there's the difference. Okay. Yeah. So the one thing you always realize between every you know group or whatever is always some. Crossover is not not always a binary you know, chart. That's one thing you can tell your students or whoever's in the lake on, the, on your crew with you is that there's almost never a gray area. I mean, black and white in nature. There's always an ecotone in a plant system where the, the chaparral is in the coastal sage scrub or whatever. Same thing with animals. There's an overlap and things kind of. That's what you're referring to. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. There's almost never a black and white section. Okay, here this is a wet area and this is a dry area right here. It's just like, okay, we have the coastline oak here, we have the sycamore here. The one sycamore needs a lot of water, coastline oak doesn't need much. But they live together, why is that? Well, it's an area of the whole black area, basically. So, same thing happens with animals. Uh, but that was a good one about the legs, yes. You do have to have legs to have claws. <laughs> Not phrase, but claws. Uh, and then let's see, we have, um, ah, the most, I was saving the most important one for last. I'm trying to think if there's a fourth one. I already have a fifth. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next one. This is the most important one to keep in mind. Reptiles were the first to have to develop the amniotic egg. Anybody know what an amnion is or what an amnion is? An egg in the sack? Pardon? An egg in the sack? I'm yeah. thinking like, you know, you have a baby with amniotic fluid inside. That's correct. And then inside an egg, if you ever get a hard boiled egg and you open it, there's that little thin skin on the inside yes. of the shell between there and the yolk. Yeah. That's the amnion. So what's the purpose of the amnion thing? <laughs> yeah. hmm? To protect the egg? From what? Yeah. It doesn't help much against predators, to be honest. Well, it does help against something. Yeah, it seals, it helps seal in moisture. So now, they no longer have to lay their eggs in the water. They don't have to lay them in particularly really moist land or mud that's really moist all the time. They can lay them in areas that are in the desert. They can lay eggs in the desert, reptiles. Um, and they can lay them on the land and bury them where it's, they need some moisture. They have to have something to keep the moisture, but, but they no longer have to lay their eggs in the water like the amphibians to the fish. So that was a very big uh, selling point for reptiles. Now they can come out and land and stay out on land. They didn't have to get back to the water to lay their eggs. They didn't have to go back to the water to, to find water. They could find their own water and drink it, but they didn't have to live in it. Sure. Some amphibians, like frogs, have that coating that, uh, whatever you might call it, looks like an amniotic sac around it, but ah. they're in water. Yes, like the toad eggs, which we will see later in the video, in the video, the PowerPoint. I have pictures of toad eggs, and you can see if you look carefully, maybe um, there's a clear gel around the eggs. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, it's not an amniot, but it is, it is a, protective, a protective coating for the eggs. On the other hand, they still can't be laid in, in dry land. They still have to be in the water. So it doesn't quite seal in the moisture. Uh, in the case of the toads, it helps hold them together, keep them from flying all over. Flying, they don't fly. <laughs> we use words in English that don't fly all the time. He jumped, he didn't leave his feet. Well, of course he didn't leave his feet. They're attached. They do that in basketball all the time. So, yes, that keeps them together and they don't spread out. So, this is the really important one here. If you don't remember anything else, this and the claws probably, well, they're all, they're all important. But the amnion is really important. They allow them to come out on land and be free. So free, you get out of the water. Everybody out of the pool. Okay. So, we have that. Let's see if there's anything else you want to say about that. Part. Well, the, uh, the ectotherms, the fish amphibians and reptiles, they have low metabolism. Uh, because the reason, the reason we have to eat so often is because we use the food in part to supply our heat, body warmth. We have a body temperature of approximately 98.6 is the average, otherwise a little lower, especially if you have it. But it's basically the same. And so if we go out in a 100 degree weather and we're properly dressed and we're properly hydrated and we you know, wear proper clothing, our body temperature is still going to be close to the same thing. And if we go out in zero degree weather, as long as we're dressed properly, and, and even if we're not, for a while at least, our body temperature will stay about the same. Not the same for, for ectotherms. I always have to think because I do mammals. Uh, not the same for ectotherms. They are regulated, their body temperature is approximately the same as the environment in which, they live, in which they are at that time. So if a lizard's in 60 degree weather, the body temperature is going to be about 60. And if it's 115, which they can be in the desert, the desert iguanas and, and uh, chuckwallas, their body temperature can be 110 or more. Uh, so that's one reason we don't call them cold-blooded, because they love all cold blood. Yes. So they also seem to have a tremendous range that they can be comfortable in because there are snakes that live in frigid weather 
and they're you know ectothermic but it doesn't seem to bother them their blood still seems to not freeze and <clears throat> even though everything around them is frozen absolutely garter snakes are a good example they they can hatch when there's still snow I uh, shouldn't say hatch because garter snakes are born live I thought myself I know before you did. Uh, they're born live but they are born where there's still snow in a lot of times in Canada, for example. And there's something on the, in their internal chemistry that's sort of like an antifreeze. There's some frogs and you know, toads like that, too. And they can, they can uh, survive a great range of temperatures. Yeah. Um, probably not as great as humans, but maybe. <coughs> it um, of course, we have to dress up properly for whatever weather we're in. They don't have that advantage most of the time. But that's, but that's very true, yeah. And now we have, that'll take me to the next part, which is uh, the type of birth. And we mentioned earlier about egg laying versus live birth. There are actually three birthing methods for herbs. One is egg laying, and I'll give you the actual term for it. You can decide to remember it if you want to. If not, you don't have to. Oviparous, over meaning egg in Latin. Then we have, you can probably figure this one out. Oh, no. Yeah. It'll work. Because from here on, it's the same. We'll just start there. There. Viviparous. Vi, 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 vi meaning live, alive. Mm -hmm. And then we have ovo. Why? Viviparous. Oval by viviparous. The third type. Now, examples of these, well, first of all, what they are, oviparous obviously means lay eggs, the legs inc lay eggs, not lay eggs, lay eggs, the eggs incubate, and then they hatch after a certain period of time. Vi viviparous, garter snakes, boas, for example. Um, Live young, they give live birth. They develop fully inside the, the, the mother. Um, if you want to call them mothers, most of the time they're just females. Really. Uh, but they develop inside the, the animal, and then they are born alive. Then, and that would be again the bows and the uh, the bows and the what did I just say? Her? Sydney. Yeah. Thank you. And then ovoviviparous. The eggs develop, there are eggs, but they stay inside the body and then they hatch there and then they, and then they come out. And that would be like our rattlesnakes, the crotalus uh, genus we have here. Those are ovoviviparous, and some of the animals in the eastern hemisphere are too. So we have three different types of birth. Now, with amphibians, I think all amphibians in the Western Hemisphere are oviparous. There are some salamanders in the, the which one is it? I have it right here. Uh, I probably had it on here, which one? Oh, <laughs> some old world salamanders uh, did live birth. But that's uh, over in the Western Hemisphere. I don't think any amphibians give live birth. So we have the three types of birth in here. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. One thing I didn't say that I see here on my notes with regard to differences between amphibians and reptiles. Occipital condyle sounds really, really good. Word. Occipital condyle is what is how the uh, the head is attached to the spine in effect. Now, a single occipital condyle is what humans have. We, we can do that, not as far as well, maybe, but we can do it. Amphibians have a, a dual, uh, dual occipital condyle, two of them. That means that their neck is fused to their head, their neck is fused to their spine. So a toad can't do this, can't do it. They have to go like this, other than the ground. If you ever watch one, a toad or a frog or any other amphibian, they have to do this when they want to look behind them and take care of their heads. 
because they have paired, paired occipital condyle, and it doesn't allow them to turn their heads like that. So that's another difference between amphibians and reptiles. Okay. And let's see. The oviparous ape laying mammals are the kind you'll find where it, usually where it's a little warmer and moister um, in order to keep the eggs uh, alive and able to hatch. Whereas live birth can take place in the colder areas and the higher elevations because they can't really incubate the eggs there, the temperature isn't right. So they give live birth and then they're pretty much ready to go for birth. So that's a generalization. And of course there's again the gray areas, not the black and white, but there's an overlap. But that's a, a difference between them. Okay. Dinosaurs uh, disappeared about 65 million years ago. And the, the prevailing theory is that they disappeared because a meteor hit the earth and then it destroyed all the environment and then it killed the dinosaurs. I personally think it might have been reptile dysfunction. <laughs> 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 Sure. I wasn't there. That was just before my time. <laughs> now we have a video coming up in which I, I was able to, fortunate enough to see some California newts up at First Water in Sierra Madre. Um, and they'll show, well you'll see it, it's actually a mating ball of newts. And it's very fascinating if you've never seen it before. I haven't. And so I have it on the video, and you'll get to see that. Um, fertilization, probably should have done before I did the egg line, but hey, what's chronology? <laughs> fertilization. Almost all amphibians have external fertilization. Even when you see toads, for example, the male on the back of the female, there's really no insertion. He just release, she releases the eggs, he releases the sperm, and go into the water. And then potluck, you know, mm -hmm. good luck, roll the dice and see how many survive. That's why you'll find that some animals that reproduce that way lay lots and lots of eggs. Mm -hmm. For example, amphibians will lay anywhere from one to 20,000 eggs at a time. Hmm. The 20,000 being the bullfrog, which uh, we have around here, not later, but thanks to some people we have them. Occasionally, uh, up to 20,000 eggs. Reptiles, on the other hand, somewhere between the one and 200. The, uh, some of the sea turtles will lay about 200 eggs at once. Um, our western fence lizard here, for example, will lay seven to 10 eggs. Mm -hmm. How often are they mating? Well, that's a good question. Um, you, can, you can observe this. Like Mugby Barra said, you can observe a lot just by watching. Uh, <laughs> but you can, when you go out, at times, uh, I'll go out when the weather permits, when it's not like this, mm -hmm. and I'll see lizards about this tall and cute little things. I uh, know that that's about the time when the eggs hatch, so I keep track of that. And I don't know exactly when, but probably in the late spring and early fall, they're still showing too, because not long ago, probably within the last three weeks, I saw some little lizards, which I thought was kind of late in the year, but they were still some. Very small. Kind of the tail, they're about like that. <laughs> Cute. Uh, a little step on you can look where you're going. So, probably twice a year. I, I don't know for sure. I'm kind of guessing on that, but if you need to know exactly, we'll look it up later and remind me. Uh, so, so, we do have that. Um, when there's Internal fertilization, which I guess not all the amphibians have in terms because because of the new ball we have here. But um, but the reptiles are all internal fertilization. There are no reptiles that have external fertilization. At least that's what I've read. I always hesitate to say no, never, nothing, none, all is is seldom correct. But as far as I know, all reptiles have internal fertilization. So they must 
Yes, you may. Just really quick, can you just say what is the, the main difference or like just your main bullet points of internal versus external fertilization? Well, the main point is whether or not they actually insert the penis into the cloaca, which is usually what it's called. So then if it's internal, are they asexual in a sense? Just word that again for me, say it again. So if their like, fertilization process is an internal thing as opposed to external, then are they like asexual in a sense? Like they're reproducing on their own? No. No. Okay. No. You mean the ones that are external? Internal. Okay, the ones that are internal. No, no, this is sexual reproduction. It requires okay. both gains, the male and the female, okay. um, in those cases. We do have, well, not here in California, but in Arizona. In Arizona, I don't know if it's the entire state, but virtually all of the, um, the whiptail lizards are female, no males. They reproduce parthenogenically. They just lay fertile eggs without the male. A lot of women are going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see anybody do that here. I can imagine it going too. But anyway, yeah. So that's the difference. But, but some uh, some of them they do, they do deposit like a sperm packet into the female through the cloaca, which is used for sexual reproduction, but also for extreme body fluids and and, and for solids. Say no thing in our uh, Okay, and by the way, our Pacific tree frog here uh, lays about 600 eggs. Wow. And that frog is only this big. Helen Wong, who speaks quietly and fast, our nature center director, she was leading a group one day, and she, she sometimes mumbles. And so I'm in the back of, of this group sweeping and and she says holds up her hand with his thumb and says the frogs what sounded like to us in the back the frog's ear are the size of my thumb and as soon as she said that she meant here the frog's ear are the size of my thumb and I knew what she meant but this lady went and I said no she said the frog's ear she just ah, I thought she said the frog's ear <laughs> so the point is our frogs the, the native Tree frogs, they're not true frogs, they're tree frogs. They're about the size of my thumb. They don't get much bigger than that. Um, and we'll have pictures of that too. So I, I want to be able to show you uh, some of these things here. Because these are some things you will see and some you might see. And we'll have important differences among the lizards and the snakes and some of the amphibians that you might encounter here. Um, so I do want to go over that. Uh, any questions about what we've covered? We've asked some good questions already, and I appreciate it. Yes? Um, the living, the three births for, um, they were the, the oviparous, can you say that? Oviparous. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then the next one was viviparous. Uh-huh. Vivi, vivi. Viviparous or viviparous? Uh-huh. Living. Can you explain that one one more time? Just real quick. Yeah, it just means live birth. Just live birth. Uh-huh. Like humans. Okay, well, what was the third one? Ovo Okay. That's egg life. Egg life. Ovo egg live life birth. And what animal does that? Uh, our rattlesnake does. Our okay. rattlesnake does. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. That's okay. okay. That's great. Yeah, but you got a little bit confused with that too, and I've heard this lecture before. Uh-huh. Uh, the rattlesnake, the ovoviviparous, that's what I've always heard is like the egg is sort of like hatched inside the rattlesnake, and then the young rattlesnake comes out. And how does that differ though from the oviviparous? Yeah, well, that's that's one of those gray areas. But they do come out with like a, a yoke over them, a coating. The rattlesnakes? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they do kind of come out with part of, part of that on them still. But that's one of the gray areas. That's the overlap thing. Yeah. Is that actually a shell in the case that Ron's talking about inside? And do they eject that later, like uh, an afterbirth or something? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, I'm not sure if it's actually, I don't know that if there's actually a shell. Okay. I think it's, I'm not sure. Right. I just have to be honest sometimes and say I'm not sure. 
Um, Check with the rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> If you know the answer, if you know the answer, go ahead and tell us. Do you know? I think. Do you know the answer? So I think I'm not 100%, but I think it has to do with the, where the nutrients are coming from. So rivet births, like what I eat, will um, like feed the baby, right? Over river births, that the nutrients are already in that sac. Right? So yes. I think that's the difference. So what I eat today doesn't affect the, the rattlesnake baby, right? Mm -hmm. It's all the nutrients are already there. I think that's the Yeah, that, that's good. And do they have a shell outside? They don't have a hard shell, right? I don't, I don't, know. Know. I don't <laughs> think they do. Right? They have some sort of sack where the nutrients are already there. They do have a sack, yes. Yes. So you see a lot of us are having trouble then distinguishing the viviparous from the ovoviviparous mm -hmm. because sure. um, you know what exactly would be the difference? Well, you could think of the eggs as hatching internally versus externally. That's a simplification. Mm -hmm. um, but don't I have eggs in me? Pardon? You know, but I have a placenta. You know, yeah. but I would have a placenta. They don't. Right. Yeah. Not not as such. No, they don't. Right. Yeah, even some animals don't have the same. <clears throat> yeah, not too many. It, it, it looks like when I'm googling it right now, but it looks like the the thing that they're in is just kind of like a. It looks kind of like a sack, but it's like kind of opaque, like you can't really see through it. So I don't think it's necessarily a shell in the sense that it's right. something that hardens, but it is a form of it. But it looks like it's like super membrane. Yeah, sure. yeah, it's actually yeah. yes. <laughs> 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 a lot. It can be a lot. What may seem like a lot you know, may not be because of, a lot of times there are big groups of garter snakes. Excuse me. So the question was how many garter snakes uh, are born at the same time? And I don't know the exact number, um, I'm not sure. And, and as she said, it looks like a lot, but sometimes garter snakes congregate in large groups, and you know, maybe some of them are adults. I don't know, that's something I have to check on. Uh, but if you remind me, I'll check on it. Sure. Um, should we take a short break? You want to take a break down? Sure. Yeah, let's go to the, the video. Okay, so let's take a break and be back. More fun part, because you get to see something other than letters on a chalkboard. Herpetology, reptiles, and amphibians, I guess we already know that much, right? Uh, this presentation, I helped with putting together and some of the photos and videos are mine, but Mickey Long did the majority of it. Mickey Long was a biologist who uh, worked for the county for over 30 years. He was at Eaton Canyon for over 30 years. He was the uh, nature center supervisor, worked up to that, and then he was the natural areas supervisor over Placerita Canyon and the other natural areas. Mickey's a, a great person, you know, he's a good friend of mine too. Uh, and so he's allowed me to use some of his uh, visual aids. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when he's done such a good job already. So, so we all use this. Um, this will give you an idea of some of the things you can expect to see and hope to see, and maybe not see, but okay. This is one of Mickey's he put in there. <laughs> Mickey has a good sense of humor. Okay, Western Newt. Uh, we can tell that it's an amphibian and not a reptile mostly because of what? The skin is moisturized. Skin is moisturized, There's no, there are no what? Claws. Claws or scales, both, very good, you got them both. Yep, and so it looks like a lizard to a lot of people, especially kids if they don't know. Um, well, adults too. It looks a lot like a lizard, so why isn't it a lizard? Well, we know, we know why now. Cal a Western Newt, very, very, oh, before I say that, I can guarantee I know 100% certain, with 100% certainty, that not one of you in here has eaten one of these. <laughs> very, very toxic. 
They have the same type of poison that that fugu fish in Japan has. That the chefs have to have a special license to cook it because it's so poisonous. Same toxin in here. This is a Tarika terosa. It has a Tarika um, poison in it. Very, very, very toxic. Um, I think they said, well, I don't know the figures, but approximately a few drops can, or they can contain enough to kill like 10,000 mice or something. I mean, it's just incredible. So they can be handled. Mickey's handled them, but you shouldn't put your hands in your mouth afterward. You can't remember whether you did that or not because you wouldn't get enough really to kill you. Um, but I wouldn't want to do it. Is there any animal that has some kind of immunity? Is there a you know, I don't know. I don't know of anybody. Does anybody know of one that would eat a California newt? I don't know of one. They could I exist. That's the one we used to have here. We have one that eat. Well, we used to have one that eat in Canyon too. Several, three or four. The juvenile will raise its tail like that. Um, probably not so much as a threatening technique or threatening uh, posture, but probably more likely to attract a predator's attention to its tail because that's a non-vital part of the body. And they won't hold on to it for very long anyway. Uh, and they can regenerate their tail like a lot of lizards can. So that is a, a mechanism. It's a defense mechanism, but it's more of an escape mechanism. And I think that's Mickey Long's hand, too. Uh, that's it. Oh. You know, I'm not sure how I play the this video. Is, let me just click again here. Let's, if that's a video, yeah, I think you should, I should, I just uh, play this. I think I just touch it. Oh. So so like, try this. This is a Just click on the video. Oh, I have a problem with that. Yeah, sometimes we have a problem with videos here. Push the newt's tail. Push the newt's tail. I never thought about it. Here it is. You have to use the pad. Oh, there it is. Okay. It should go. It should. It's not. You guys got that back on the bottom? Yeah, we're trying here. But it says media not found. You know what? On the screen, the mouse isn't there. <laughs> the is in a different place. Try, uh, try looking at the screen and see if using that play button, see if that makes a difference. Uh, no, you're right. Space bar for a second. Space bar is something that's working. There you go. Is it going? Yeah, but you got the arrow. No. You're going to get yours a little bit. I don't think it, it says it's media not found. Media not found. It's not, I don't think it has yeah, no, no, it's yeah, it's the video. It's not embedded in the slideshow. It should be, actually. Uh, Let's We'll skip it for now. We can try to get out of the slideshow. Well, we'll do, we can come back to it, I guess. Well, we can do that now and then show the other one, too. Oh, it's not two of them. It is, because we don't have Wi-Fi here. So now it's not, it's it's not, not on the internet. It's but, uh, yeah, yeah, try the... Uh, it's the... Which, uh, it's in the ECSA. ECSA. No, those are training. Dozen training. 2019. 2019. <laughs> so maybe that's, let's see, what does it say? California. California. Oh, is that the one we're looking for? Yeah. Dozen training. I think it's only herbs. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do this. And then California meat, first water. First water. Whichever one you're working on meat. Yeah, you have back up from that. Okay. There we go. So here's California Newt. I saw this up at First Water in Sierra Madre. That's a good place to find them. Notice, I thought at first they was trying to eat some insect or something on the surface, but, but in actuality, I think it's really gulping air that they do that. Um, I guess that's it. You didn't even need any popcorn for that. <laughs> okay, and then while you're in there, you might as well do the other one. Uh, the one right above it. The meatball? Yeah. This is first water also. This is what I was talking about with regard to the uh, negative ball. Mm -hmm.
Um, same place, exactly the same spot. Well, within a few feet of the spot of the other one, different day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that somebody voted most popular. Yeah, the drone. She says the drone is actually the spider. Oh, oh, the, uh, that's good. That's good. Uh, okay, so weird. It is. Right. <laughs> it is. So what's happening? Turn <laughs> one. <laughs> Didn't even get a dinner. Get a room. Yeah. 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 I'll yeah. explain this to the kids. Hey, hey. Well, well <laughs> nothing to see here. <laughs> I guess the best way to explain it to the kids would be to say that they have to have more, more, put more men on the job. No. They have to. Uh, Meat more in order because there's so much uh, attrition. The, the eggs disappear and they're eaten, and so they have to make sure that there is fertilization. We so, just forget that whole thing. Yeah, you could yeah. do that too. <laughs> but you won't. You won't probably see that. It's very unusual to see that. And then, then they get into a point where they just start rolling downstream too. Uh, it's actually quite fascinating. Uh, it's hard to tell at the moment, but we counted, there was somebody with me at the time, and we counted about 10 altogether, because there, oh there are some others in the area, a few feet away, that will show up, I believe, in, later in this, no, yep, a little later in this video, yep, yeah, no, yep, yeah, no, is it over? Yeah, that's over with uh, No. <laughs> Back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, now I think we can stick with the PowerPoint. Well, yeah, we have other videos too, so. Well, we can show them as we go. I'm sorry, did you have a question here? Um, yeah. Are there still any of these in Plastery Canyon? They might have a better idea than I about here, because I'm from. Well, in the, in yeah, as far as newts and. Uh, what's the other ones? Salamanders. Newts and salamanders. I've been here since 2002, that's what, 17 years. I've seen one salamander way up on the Los Pinatos Trail, under a rock, after a rock slide, after a big rain, one salamander. That's the only thing I've seen. So they're very rare. If you saw that, you would be very blessed. And, and something like almost 30 years ago, there used to be a tree, a multi-trunk tree, kind of at the, near the base of the Los Pinatos Trail, by the Canyon Trail, that my son used to go to and start digging in the leaves in the multi trunk, and he would find little, we weren't uh -huh. sure if they were newts or salamanders. Uh huh. But we haven't seen them in a long time. Yeah, they're starting to decline for the most part, but California is still fairly prevalent, which is good. Some of the others, which we'll see here, they're, they're not, uh, not as common as they used to be. This is what you would expect to see with regard to new eggs in clusters enclosed in a gel, um, attached to some structure in the water, most likely. Um, there's another picture here. Well, that's an arboreal salamander. So for the newts, it would be underwater. They would lay their eggs underwater. This is an arboreal salamander. Um, by the way, a newt is a salamander. Uh, it's They're both in the family salamandridae. So, all salamanders aren't newts, but all newts are salamanders. And the basic difference is, uh, well, the name, but the, the salamanders have a real shiny, moister skin, whereas the newts have a rougher skin. You may notice that this looks much shinier than, than the picture of the, oh yeah, that's right, backwards at the top, than the, uh, See, it's, it's damp, yes, and it's a little bit shiny, but it also looks kind of rough. Whereas the salamander, very smooth and moist. So there is that difference. And there are some other differences too, but that's the main one you see. So arboreal salamander, big eyes. Uh, they do climb oak trees, and if you get them at the right time of year, uh, when it's misting, like maybe at the moment when it's rainy and not raining too hard, they can sometimes be found on the side of oak trees uh, climbing them. And they're becoming rare, like most of these uh, animals, which you'll see. 
Are those yellow, yellow, yellow dots? Is that, is that well, just an artifact or is that the actual animal? No, they're actually on there. Yeah, it's probably a camouflage. Is he toxic feature. too? Pardon? Is he toxic too? Yeah, yeah. but not like the not like the new. Okay. They all have a certain amount of bad tasting and or toxic skin, so they don't they don't so ostensibly so they don't get eaten. Um, I don't know of an actual toxin in there per se, but it probably is somewhat. What eats it then? Pardon? What does eat it? Uh, let's see, eating the salamanders. Well. You know, the garter snakes will eat tadpoles and frogs, and they might even eat salamanders, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what all of their prey are, especially on a salamander per se. On the newt, there aren't too many. Uh, but I'm trying to think of what, what might eat that and still survive. Uh, I don't know if a bullfrog would eat one or not. Bullfrogs will eat almost anything, that's why I said that. Uh, I'm not, not real sure on this one. This is a typical habitat for a memorial salamander. So some of their habitat is disappearing, and then there are also some other factors too, such as some uh, diseases going around of their, that affect them, um, some toxins uh, in the air and water. This is how they might lay their eggs, kind of like groups, uh, like grapes, bunches of grapes uh, in, a, in a log or or overhang of some sort, some place where it's very, very moist. Uh, in fact, those are probably in the water there. Okay, black vented slender salamander. It's a slender salamander. Right? Sometimes people might think it's a, a worm or a snake. Um, this isn't a snake, you can tell, because it does have legs. There's one leg right here, there's a leg here, and there are two other legs out of focus back here. Very small legs. Um, this animal is not going to be balancing on telephone wires most of the time, but uh, the legs allow it to get into small spaces. It's very slender. So it can climb into very small spaces, kind of like a snake. This is another, this is a garden slender salamander. And this one, uh, we know, that, we know that these salamanders are declining because we offered them food and they didn't take it. <laughs> Different decline. Uh, but they are declining due to their habitat mostly and some other things, fungus. Uh, garden slender salamander has bigger feet and a bigger head than the prior ones we looked at, than the arboreal or the, uh, the black vented. So it has bigger head. They, they all have big eyes, these do. Now this one was recent, by geological terms, very recent, it's 1985, right here. This was discovered in 1985. Um, so it is, there are still some things out there that haven't been discovered yet. And this one is uh, still rare. I don't know how many have been seen as of now, but it's a recent sighting and, and uh, the recent, uh, entry into the uh, fishing books. As you can see, the body isn't very long. About uh, from tip of the nose to the hind legs is probably close to five centimeters if you stretch it out straight. And, and that's what, three inches or so? Is that what, five centimeters, uh, two inches, probably. So not very big. The body's only about that big. Looks a lot bigger on the screen. So here's a little bit of the uh, authentication about it. I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, the Trachoceps gabrieli. These slender salamanders are in the genus Trachoceps. And uh, a funny note for Mickey Long is that he wouldn't marry his current wife Jan until she memorized all seven subspecies of the salamander. <laughs> Smart. Monterey salamander. <laughs> so she had to remember Crociator and she called Croc Eater. It's kind of a funny story, but it's a true story. She did marry him, so I don't know if it was true that he wouldn't have, but he did tell her that. It's a favorite story of hers. Okay, Monterey salamander. Wearing goggles. <laughs> uh, this one is interesting in a way because. Yes, they do appear near here. We don't, I've never seen one. 
That's the one we saw, Chuck. Uh, Is it? Ian identified it for me oh, all good. those years ago at the Volos Pinatos Trail. I didn't know. I thought it was a space alien. But anyway, <laughs> took pictures and Ian identified it as Mallory's own. Ron, how big was it? Oh, it was tiny. It was like, you know, I don't know. Two inches? Yeah, maybe three, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. Good. Well, if Ian identified it, was probably right. Yeah. He's, he's pretty sharp. Uh, Monterey salamander. Now, these are both Monterey salamanders, the same species. Okay, we call them, here again, common name versus scientific name. Large blotch salamander, Monterey salamander. They're the same genus and species. They're different subspecies. And what apparently happened is the Monterey salamander uh, was came down from the north along the west side of the mountains, between the, between the mountains and the coast. Mm -hmm. The large blot salamander came over the mountains, along the mountains, and perhaps on the east side, I'm not sure about the east side, but at least in the mountains. And so they evolved over time to these different appearances. They look like completely different species, but they are the same species, I was assured of that. Um, now, why do you think that there would be maybe a, such a difference in the, in the look? The climate? Pardon? The climate? Could be the climate. Uh, I don't know. How would that affect the, the coloration or whatever? I'm not well, sure. Like whatever they're around, they blend into you. Yeah. That's a better term, yeah. yeah. Camouflage. That's what I Camouflage. Their, yeah. Their that's, why, that's why I pressed you for a little more, because I thought that's what you <laughs> meant. Yeah, most likely for camouflage, because if you're in the forest, this color, or this color blends in more with, with the leafy areas and, and speckles sunlight through the, the leaves. Whereas the other one blends in more with the ground tones, most likely. And that's probably the reason why they evolved like this. It's too bad Darwin wasn't around to see this. He could have probably done a great study on this. Uh, but very, very interesting that these are the same genus and species. Yeah, here we have, uh, anybody know what that is? Um, frog legs to feed them. <laughs> it's actually a cane toad, very good. This is probably an Australian. Cane toad, uh, bigger than our salamanders we just saw. <laughs> uh, this is a good example of um, the cure being worse than the uh, ailment. There were pests uh, eating the sugar cane in cane fields. So they imported these cane tones, and they sure took care of them, but they took care of everything else, too. Anything big enough to get into its mouth probably was eaten. Um, it's like a, 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 over like a bullfrog on steroids or something. Uh, huge animal, very, very huge, but became a problem, especially in Australia and maybe some other places, because now all of a sudden they have a cane toad problem. Now they have to bring in something to get rid of the cane toads, and then that'll become a problem. It is not fair, I think. Okay, this is one of the most common amphibians you'll see here, probably the most common. It's the most common one we see in Eaton Canyon. This and two other <coughs> two other amphibians are the ones we will see most often there. Um, well, three, there's another species. But western toad, this is very common. This is the biggest uh, amphibian that we have in Eaton Canyon. They'll get to be about this big. They're, they're big and fat sometimes. Western toad is easy to tell because they have this white line down the back. Right there. You see it in both pictures here. I don't show you on this wing tail here. Uh, yeah, white line down the back. Easy to tell a western toad. If you see a toad, a big toad here, or that you, if you know whether it's a toad or a frog, but if it's something big, and it doesn't have a white stripe down the back like that, it's probably not something that belongs here. Um, we have people that drop off other types of toads and frogs at Eaton Canyon, and they don't have that stripe. So every western toad should have, and there's that every again, should have that white stripe on there to make it easily identifiable. The, toad, the frogs we have are small. They're not true frogs, they're tree frogs, which I'll show you. But, Western toad, Bufo boreus, again, that's the scientific name, which you don't have to use, but if somebody says, I saw a white striped toad, well, maybe that's what they call them. 
if not here, maybe they call them that in Arizona or California or Colorado or somewhere. They might call that a white striped toad. It, same genus and species, perhaps. But if you know it's a Bufo boreus and you can follow and you can authenticate that, you know you have the same animal at least. Okay, western toad. We talked about this earlier. These are western toad eggs. They're laid in what we like to refer to as a string of pearls. You find them in the stream bed, um, probably in another couple of months or so in Eaton Canyon, March or April. We should start having toad, toad eggs in the uh, stream. They're not laid in clusters like frogs. They're laid in strings. And if you look carefully, I'm not sure you can because I'd like to get some new pictures because this is taken with an old camera. This was taken probably early 2000s, so not as good a technology now. But each of these strings has a clear, translucent <coughs> gel around it. I'm not sure if there's a better place to see it, but every one of those has it. That's what's holding them in the string. Are they like in a tube and the eggs are in there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. They are. Like that. Wow. And they're, they <coughs> attach one end of it to the string bottom, and when the stream is flowing and they have the eggs in there, you'll see them going like this. It almost, at first from a distance, almost looks like there's some plant, with, you know, that's flowing and waving in the water. And then you get up close and you see, oh, it's actually strings of eggs. The eggs are dark on top and light on the bottom, and why is that? To protect them from the sun while they're in the wild? Yeah, because of the view. Now, this background is kind of light, so it's not serving the purpose, but the basic idea is viewed from above against the dark surface, darker surface, they'll blend in more. And if they're up above and somebody somebody comes underneath them and they see them, then they're lighter and they blend, blend in more with the sky. So a couple of spots where you can barely see the two. Uh, yeah. It's really hard to see. You know, actually, if I hold this still enough, <coughs> right here, right there, there's a line. Right, that's one of the line spots. Right there, gel. There's one right here, too. Yeah. It's a little hard to see, right between these two lines of them. And to right, the right, there's right a right there. pronounced one. Move over to the right. Uh -huh. Go up. Oh, here. There. Yeah, there. Yeah. Really yeah. Come back. Come back. Put your shoe on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, right here. Right here. Yeah, you can see it better there. I'll keep that in mind for future uses of this, too. Thank you. So there's two? Is that two? Uh-huh. Like yeah, it just happens to be bent there. Um, the nice thing about this is that if you see them, you know they're going to hatch into tadpoles. Okay. Toad, toad poles, not tree frog tadpoles. Um, because the, the frogs, the tree frogs lay theirs in clusters. So you can tell the difference on that. These are toad tadpoles, western toad tadpoles. Anybody have an idea? I don't think there are any tree frog tadpoles in there, but do you have an idea what might be the difference, the, the most striking difference between the tree frog and the toad tadpoles? Mm -hmm. Yes? Size? Pardon? Size? Somewhat. Uh, some of the tree frogs have larger and some have smaller tadpoles. Yeah, that might not be the first thing you notice. It might be, but there's even one more, and that is that they're like a sandy color. They're lighter and speckled, and they blend in really well with the bottom of the stream. Whereas the tub eggs stand out pretty much, and at least where they are in our area. It's pretty easy to find toad eggs even from a distance. I'm, I'm not sure why they wouldn't be camouflaged a little better. The, the tree frog eggs are, but the tadpoles are. Um, but I don't have any pictures of the tree frog tadpoles, but they they look look like the same shape, of course. Some of them are a little bigger, but they are light and speckled color. Could you say something about the difference between frogs and toads? And uh huh. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Frogs and toads. Let me go back to the picture because toads have these uh, poison glands, warts. They don't give you warts, but they need to keep them. Uh, not, you don't get warts from touching toads. But they do have what are called warts, these bumps on the back that have these venom in them. Same thing over here, along the back. These contain venom, and especially up near the head, which is where a lot of animals like to grab 
other animals for prey around the head. They have even bigger ones. They have a big parotoid gland here uh, with venom in it. And the, the frogs don't have that. They don't have this. That's the main difference, the easiest way to tell. Good point. Thank you for mentioning that because I might have skipped over that. Okay, western toad eggs, tadpoles, no longer eggs. Okay, notice the spelling of tree frog. That's not a misprint, that's one word. It's not a true frog, it's a tree frog. And the difference is that they have the pads on their toes for climbing up things like trees and rocks. Um, the regular toads don't have the regular frogs don't have this. They don't have claws, as we already discovered, but they also don't have the pads on their toes for climbing up like glass, for example. So tree frogs, but as you can see here, they're not always on trees. They sit on our rocks in the canyon and blend in very well. They can lighten or darken. They're not like a chameleon. They can't change colors, but they can lighten or darken to fit in uh, more with their background. I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, and I did take this picture, but here in the bottom picture, this one looks a little darker than that one. It might have been there longer. That was in one of our terraria there at the Eden Canyon on display. Um, that's not a real rock. It's just an artificial background. The one above is on a rock. Uh, I think it's a rock. It looks like a rock. Um, so they can't lighten the dark and to blend in. But notice that the... Uh, Sudacris means false cricket. Cadaverina is pretty clear from English. It almost looks like a cadaver sitting there. It pulls on its legs, uh, makes it less easily identified as an animal with legs, as, as something alive to predators. So they do, do pull on their legs and they look like a lump on, on a rock. Now we have Pacific tree frog. Those are the two types we have in Eaton Canyon. We don't have any true frogs in Eaton Canyon. Um, well, at the moment we might, somebody might have dropped one off, but we don't have any native true frogs in Eaton Canyon, just tree frogs. They are in the, in the genus Sudacris, it used to be Hyla, but true frogs are in the Rana, R-A-N-A, -A, genus, which is actually the Spanish name for frog, word for frog. Uh, but we have Pacific tree frogs are easy to tell from our California tree frogs because they have this eye strike going right through the eye here. Uh, the Pacific tree frogs have these, some are brown, some are green, a couple of variations here. But both these animals on the right in the photos have eye stripes. It's not as obvious on the one on the right because it's shown from above. But it's easy to tell a Pacific tree frog from a California tree frog by that strike through the eye. Now, when you hear the frogs chirp, uh, especially in the spring during mating season, they go crazy at night. The California tree frog, you hear, rep, 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 rep. Pacific tree frog, rep, 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 rep. That's how you can tell the difference between the two. Um, Mickey Long likes to say that you see these movies when people are out at night and they're camping or something. And, just, just before the monster eats the two teenagers, um, <laughs> you'll hear, rah, 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 rah. well, they're in North Carolina or wherever, or, or somewhere in the east, and they're doing a Pacific tree frog tone. And Mickey, Mickey likes to make, he notices those things. Uh, but this is the two tone, the two tones, sort of two tone also, but, but this is the rah, 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 rah. When you have a bunch of them going on at once, it's pretty hard to tell whether you're hearing two singles or, or one double. <laughs> You'll hear a rip, 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 it might sound like a rack. But that's, that's the difference between those. We don't see these as often, not nearly as often as the California tree frog. Okay, here again we have the western, the Wiley Canyon frog. No. Uh, western, of the Pacific tree frog, we can tell because of the, the line through the eye. Okay, anybody know what this is? <laughs> it is. Who said that? Go ahead. Uh oh. <laughs> That's good. I wonder if that came up automatically or if I, no, I pressed it twice. And this raccoon was in my life. I couldn't see it on the screen. It was right behind the raccoon. That's good. I was impressed. You shouldn't have told me. Because then after that, I would have pressed the button and said, 
Oh, okay, well, it says up here, it's a Western State Foot. You could have gone, I knew that. That's what it is, it's a Western State Foot. Um, it's, it's rare, we don't see them around here much. Uh, I've never seen one, actually. They're nearby, but more, let's see, State Foot. The nearest ones are in North LA County, they're rare. And they can stay underground when it's dry in a cocoon, a moist cocoon for about six to eight months before they have to come out of the Weren't those more common here, like 30, 40 years ago, than they are now? Or I wasn't here then, but most likely. I've heard that they used to be around here. So if you see one, that's more common, because <laughs> they're so rare. Uh, probably, yeah, I don't know when they were last seen here. But I'm sure they were at one time. Deacon Canyon, too, probably. Um, any idea why they call them spadefoot? That's not up there yet. Diggers? They're diggers? Which is what? Oh, that they are diggers? They dig, but there's there's more more specific reason. It's a hard thing on their back feet. back in. Yeah, right here. They have this little hardened piece of skin, not a claw, of course. A little hardened piece of skin, and they use that for digging. Since they don't have any claws, they can't really dig like a lizard could dig, um, except for a legless lizard. <laughs> uh, they can dig as well as a legless lizard, probably. Uh, they don't have claws, but they do have the, the hardened, uh, like a callus on the back feet, on the heels, so they can use that for digging, and that's the spade foot part of their name. That's where it comes from. Scaffy opus, I believe. And this is, uh, I'm not sure exactly where that is. The name on here, right here on this plaque, says Frank T. DeVore Classroom. He was a naturalist who was here at Classroom in Canyon, Canyon. This is Frank in the background behind this guy. This is not Mickey, though, either. I don't know who it is. But Mickey said that's Frank DeVore in the background. So he was there uh, studying spadefoots at that time. And I don't know exactly where this is. I thought they said it was out near the desert somewhere, but I'm not sure. You know, somebody, I've seen this slide before, and somebody said the, I don't know who it was, Ian or somebody, the Bokeh Canyon Reservoir. You know, that sounds familiar. You know, it's heading off towards Antelope Valley. Okay. So I, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think I remember somebody saying Bokeh Canyon Reservoir. I remember Bokeh Canyon too, and I wasn't sure if it was this slide or another yeah, one. Yeah, it might have been another one. It could very well be. But that's kind of the thing that they would need for survival. Okay, Mountain Yellow Lake of Frog. They are getting exceedingly rare. They're the most common frog nearby, uh, near us. Uh, not in Eaton Canyon, we don't have them. But in the mountains nearby, we'll see a little uh, map here. I may go ahead and show you that map. And then we'll come back to this. This is their habitat. Mm. which is declining, so here we have to see the range of the yellow legged frog. Uh, and of course, we are down here in this area, and this was, I don't know when this was, was published, but there probably aren't nearly as many of those now. But their habitat is declining, partly because of uh, the habitat itself being taken over by humans, and partly because of some things like fungus, again, and the other one I wrote down was Ultraviolet light also affects them. I don't know what they did. There's been ultraviolet light ever since they've been around, but, but that's one of the things that's apparently been affecting them. But we'll take a quick look at it again. This is the underside. They do have a yellowish underside. I believe those are Mickey's hands. I think he said they were. Well, they still are, but... Uh, but anyway, that's a yellow-legged frog. The most common frog around, but not common. <laughs> Best way to describe that, I guess. Oh, oh, yep, that's right. It's the bottom one. Bottom one. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll get used to that by the time I get home. Okay, red legged frog. I guess you can see the difference between the two. It's on its natural habitat, you can see in the background there. They live on carpets. Yeah. It'd be just not like this. Uh, Red-legged frog, they're even rarer. And Mickey's, first of all, I, I mention Mickey Long a lot because for one thing, he put this together. For another thing, I learned most of what I know from him, or a lot of it. And the third thing is, his first field of study as a biologist was herpetology. 
So he was an expert in this, at least as far as our native ones and the ones in California. So he knows all sorts of things about these. He's studied them for years. Uh, this is very rare now. Uh, they're also on the endangered list. This is believed to be the famed jumping frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain. This is, this is reputed to be the frog that he based that upon, that, that book. So I don't know if, if they jump farther than other frogs or, or if he just found them more fascinating than, say, bullfrogs, I don't know. Uh, but that's supposed to be the celebrated frog. This is a habitat. Um, I don't know where this is either, but I think Mickey took this photo. Uh, very few places now you can find them. He might know where you can still find some of them, but he also may be unable to find them if he goes there. Okay, bullfrog. One thing that sets it apart, other than the size of it being really large, uh, it does not have those paratoid poison glands, so it's not a toad. It looks like <clears throat> it looks similar to a toad. It's it's pretty easy for a somebody who doesn't know to not to be able to, unable to distinguish between a frog and a toad. But this does not have those venom glands. It does have a big plate here, a tympanum, like an eardrum, and it has this huge pelvic girdle, which sticks out more when the animal is, is a little underfed and hasn't eaten recently, which in the case of a bullfrog is rare. <laughs> uh, they don't even eat rocks if they move. <laughs> uh, this is a bullfrog. They'll eat pretty much anything. So if we get a bullfrog in our pond, we need to find out about it right away and get it out of there. We have to climb in the pond and get it and use a net or whatever to get it out of there as quickly as possible. Or we have to order more mosquito fish. <laughs> uh, but they are large. Uh, this is uh, Nancy Hubs Chang. She used to work at the Nature Center at Eaton Pen. And this picture I took, somebody put that in our pond. It's a huge bullfrog. Doesn't look green there. It's a darker color, but it is a bullfrog. Um, she got it out of the pond, and as soon as we found out about it, she went out and got it. So I documented this. This was probably around 2001 or two, somewhere around there. Um, What's kind of interesting is that I put together this slide personally. They say people that have pets, sometimes that's, that toad, toad frog doesn't really look like much like Nancy, but after he was around her for a little while, he looked like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a resemblance here. Okay. Now we go into the reptiles, starting with lizards. This is a, a graphic of, well, some things are obvious, I don't need to repeat them, but I did. These are many of the things that affect a lizard in its daily life. Some things we don't think about, some things we do, some things we don't, I'm not going to read them all to you, but I, did, I should have counted them, it just said there are like 30 or whatever there are, different factors at least that affect the daily life of a, of a lizard. Uh, and these are all things that lizards have to deal with on a daily basis. And it's a wonder they can even sleep <laughs> when you look at all the things there are. From being eaten to getting the sunshine, having the proper temperature, having the water, uh, staying with predators, getting the food, as I mentioned. So this just gives you abiotic factors, which we like the climate, the weather, in this case the weather, um, and hiding places, for example. All those, all those affect it. So this gives you an idea how complicated the life of a lizard can be. It is. Okay, difference between male and female lizard. The easiest way to tell is by the post-anal scale. Right there. The anus is right here. They call it that or the cloaca because sexual reproduction and excreting body, body waste go through the same opening. So, so it's called a cloaca or a vent or anus, it's sometimes called an anus also. Males have these two larger prominent scales on the underside. Females don't have that. Females have this, basically the same size scales all the way around. Males also have these femoral pores, 
right here. Females have them too, but they're not as pronounced. Males will use them for giving off a scent and musk to mark territories and things like that, uh, perhaps to attract the females. But that's one way to tell the difference. Now, this is an iguanid, so it's not true of all lizards. But iguanids, we mentioned iguanids because our western fence lizard, our sidewash lizard here, they're in the iguanid family. Same family with those big green lizards that everybody has at home and you see in the tropics. Same family, different genus and species, but they're in the iguanidae family. Iguanidae in pictures. <laughs> so, here's how they measure a lizard. How would you guess that they might measure a lizard that they find in the wild? Just by body? Yeah. Because of its tail That's what they use. They use what's called the snout vent blade. Again, the vent being the anus or the cloaca vent. And why, why do they do it that way? Lose the, tail. the tail could be missing entirely or partly, yep. Yeah. And even when the tail regenerates, it's usually not as good as the original. Kind of like movie sequels. <laughs> Which everything is nowadays. By the way. Uh, that's my rant. Uh, so they measure generally, measuring a lizard snout vent one. And then they will talk about tail length too, because if you find one with a tail intact, then you can use that as a guide. Um, Perhaps sometimes it's it maybe, I don't know, it may be important in, the, in discerning between two species or subspecies. Maybe that makes a difference in the tail size. I don't know for sure. But the most reliable thing is the snout vent one. Okay, how long have they been in Eden Canyon? Uh, well, I know they've been there at least 20 years because I've been there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to just put these up right over through a lot of this because. You can read it for yourself. If anybody can't read it, let me know. One of Mickey's P's is that somebody will put something on the screen and they read it word for word and say, they can do that. <laughs> 9,000 plus a minus 80. Not that 11 years. <laughs> okay, this is a good example here. This graph will tell you why we don't use the term cold blooded. It's, it can be accurate at times, at the moment, but it's a very misleading term. This happens to be in Celsius because that's what scientists do. They use Celsius because we're the, we're the only ones that use Fahrenheit, except maybe the Germans do. Uh, but if you look at the Soramesis or Soramelis obesis, the chuck wall, and the Dipsosaurus dorsalis, desert iguana, which I have a picture, I think, coming up next, I took in the desert. Look at these temperatures, uh, normal activity ranges. 40 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees, by the way, Celsius is 98.6. That's where they come up with the 98.6. 37 Celsius is 98.6 in Fahrenheit. So we're talking 42 degrees. That's a 105 degrees or more. Um, this is what, 37.5 degrees, so 10 degrees. Yeah, almost 110 degrees body temperature. And that's not, it might be warmer outside, but that's their actual body temperature. And they used to have to use a probe to probe inside them to get a body temperature. Now they have more modern devices where they can do that. But as you can see, the desert iguana and the, and the chuckwalla, they like it hot. Uh, those of you old enough, just like Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon in Maryland, <laughs> Maryland, but that's an old movie. Uh, our Crotophytus is a uh, Crotophytus is a collared lizard. We don't have those in, in the canyon here. Um, Scoloporus is Scoloporus occidentalis is what we have here in, in Eaton Canyon and Placerita Canyon. That's our blue-bellied lizard, western fence lizard, blue-bellied lizard. That's a scalopolis, closely related, same genus. Uh, Occidentalis, which means west, western. Uh, fringe toad lizards we don't have here, of course. Trinosola is the horde lizard. We used to have those in Eaton Canyon, but people used to collect them, sell them as pets, and then they, they disappeared. We don't have them anymore. Uh, Sidewalk lizard, Unistans Brianna. We have those. Even they like it pretty warm. 
Let's see if they get up to about, about, about our body temperature, pretty close. It'd be hard to call that logically cold blooded. Corollus atrox is actually sidewinder. No, I'm sorry, atrox is the western diamondback. The cerastus is the sidewinder. So the sidewinder can get out there in a little bit cooler weather because they come out at night. Um, they can stay in a little bit cooler weather. The atrox is the uh, western diamondback. And the others we don't really see here in night lizards out in the desert under some yucca plants at night leaves you can find them there. So, this is why we don't say cold blooded for reptiles, because a lot of times they are not. That is a desert iguana. I was fortunate to take that out uh, in Palm Springs area. It was about, I think it was 108 degrees the air temperature, the actual official temperature at that time, about 108. When I saw him, he was out crawling around. When he crawled in the hole, it came back out, so I was able to get several nice photos. You can see I have yellow around his mouth. That's from the flowers they eat. They are eating some yellow flowers. He looks like he's posing for you. Yeah, it does. Like he's smiling. Either smiling or threatening. You know, or I can't decide which. I've known people like that. I was never able to figure it out. Right. Okay, a day in the life of a scalopterus, our western fence lizard, or as I say at Eaton Canyon, we don't have any fences, our western wall lizard. They're all over the walls. So they come out and it's cold at night, so they hide, they go under the hole or under some leaves or uh, in, a, in a log or somewhere and hide under a rock. Then when the sun comes out in the morning, they come out and they get out there in the sun as quickly as they can. And then they get out while they're still cold, they get out, they put their bodies perpendicular to the sun to get the maximum amount of rays. When they start to get too warm, they get out of the sun or they turn toward it or different orientations so the sun isn't shining directly against their backs and they won't get as much of the effect of the sun. So they come out, scientists knew this, that they come out and they get warm. And they knew the third part of this coming up where they, at the end of the day, it starts to get cold and they come back out and they go back and hide again. What they didn't really know about was this part, which is called behavioral thermal regulation. You don't have to remember it, but behavior, their actions, thermal heat regulation. So by their behavior, they regulate their body temperature. So now they come out, and it's, and it's warm, they go, oh, it's nice and warm. And then they go, whoa, wait a minute, it's starting to get a little too warm, so I'm going to go back into the shade, now it goes down. And then now it starts to get, well, it's a little too cold, so they come back out and they go back out in the heat. And then they, they do this all day long. And it keeps their body at about the right temperature the whole time. And then, when it starts the end of the day comes, then they go back and they hide again until morning and repeat the process. Side blocks lizard. I took this photo. This is the side block. Nikki couldn't explain what that was. That's just a marking on this lizard. But the darker one, further back, that's the side blotch of our side blotch lizard. Our new docents have a lot of trouble at times telling a western fence lizard from a side blotch lizard. I'll have them both together on a slide here coming up shortly. The main differences are in the coloration and the uh, speckle pattern, usually a lighter tan or light brown on the side blotch. And if you can see the side blotch, that obviously helps. The scales are not as prominent on a side blush as you can have them, but the western fence lizard, which you'll see next, has bigger scales. Um, it's a slightly bigger lizard, but size is not a good guideline to use in nature. It's often too difficult to tell because you don't have a point of reference with regard to size. They say that with birds a lot, too. So just saying a western fence lizard is usually bigger than an adult, isn't a good thing to use because if you only see one, how do you know whether it's big or not? It's only an inch or so. But those are the main things. Lighter color, different speck speckle pattern, the side blotch if they have it, and not as prone in scales. This is a side blotch juvenile of a quarter. So you can see they're not very big. This is Helen Warren's hand. I took this photo. Is there anything you see on the lizard that might be interesting? It'll come up in the next slide. Short tail. Short tail. Actually, the tail's a little longer than that. I didn't get the whole tail in the picture. So. Like the uh, third eye. Yeah. Mm. yeah. There's a parietal eye. 
on many of the iguanids, including the iguanas. It's actually a sort of a functional eye. These parts here, the the C in the video, the diagram on the right, the C stands for cornea, the I is for the iris, the R is for the retina, and the B is something else. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but but it can't see with it, but it can definitely sense light and dark. And their day can be regulated by that. I'm not sure why they, they can't just do it with their normal eyes like others do. But they have put, in experiments, put aluminum foil over that spot on the, on the lizard, and it had trouble telling when to wake up, when to go to sleep. Um, didn't have an alarm clock, so they couldn't use that. But this is functional. It, it definitely is a sensory organ. And you can see it on this lizard there. But actually, you can also see it in the next slide. There it is. Oh, I went to the next slide. That's <laughs> right, I was going back. There it is. Same lizard uh, you saw in that first slide. But there's that parietal eye. Now we go to, this is also a side blast lizard, but obviously missing something. It will regenerate. Uh, it won't, won't look as good as the original. It won't be as gradually tapered as the original, most likely. Okay, determining home range. I'm going to go through this quickly. Somebody will do an experiment to find the home range of a lizard. And this is a little too large an area that they're showing, but it's easier to see the graphic. This is Eaton Canyon Nature Center right here. This is our parking lot. This is our stream bed over here that you can barely see. This is a side watch lizard. So this is what's being used. Somebody goes out and sees the lizard and takes a note of where it is. Then it moves and they take another note in the time and they take another note. So here's what happens. This lizard does this during the day. Then they use the minimum polygon method and they describe the outer limits of its, of its uh, home range, where it goes foraging for food, um, where it lives, and where it functions. Then we have another lizard in the red. And it comes out and it does this. Same thing, and now you look, oh, right here we have an overlapping area. Right behind this plant. Right there. That's where the home ranges overlap. There could be problems there. There could be scuffles and arguments and fights. Uh, not likely to happen where it doesn't overlap. They're usually more placid and don't have that problem. Okay, home range size 130 square feet or so for the for the uh, western fence side block rather. Western fence 100 square feet. Uh, how many eggs? Mm -hmm. Again, you can read these yourself. So. Okay, now there's one you asked a question earlier. Hatch in August, under a year, under a year, under a year, yeah. Um, <coughs> young, under one inch snout event, length. And uh, so they lay the eggs in April and May and they hatch in August, okay. I'm sure I've seen some young out early in the year, especially in hot summers, but obviously, uh, most animals will live longer in captivity than in the wild because they're spoiled, have no predators. Okay, here's a western fence lizard. Now notice that it's a darker color and it has less of a speckled pattern, more of a striped pattern. Um, and when we see it up close, you can see the scales even along the back. Okay, you know what it is. Along the back, you can see the scales sticking up slightly. The scales are more prominent on this than they are on the side blocks. Side blocks it's a little smoother than the western fence lizard. There, it's on a fence post or a telephone pole, but close enough. And our western wall lizard. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I have a bunch of around this side. Can you I'm going to get a little closer so I can hear you. I have a bunch of lizards that live around my house, and he always looks like they're doing special. Uh -huh. Why would they do that? We have a, a video coming up if I can play it. I don't know if it will play on here or not, but I have one on there. So I will address your question. Okay. Um, this is high breeding plumage. This was not taken in Eaton Canyon. I'm not sure where. But they certainly have this. This is a male. Uh, the, the question, by the way, was about the push ups they do, and I'll, I'll have that coming up. Okay, this is two, uh, two of the Western Fence lizards mating. 
And again, it's a, it's a reptile, so it's internal fertilization. They must make contact. The male has two hemipenis. Uh, they use one of the hemi, one hemipenis to actually mate. I guess it's a pair and a spare. I don't know. Uh, but you can see it here in the lower picture, right there. So that's obviously a male. Okay, this is the video, and I don't know if we can get it to play or not. If not, is it, is it worth going to the second one? Because I can just describe it if it doesn't work. This should be embedded in there. Yeah, it's just media not found. Okay. I'll know how to go then. Okay. Um, yes, they do push ups. Well, what we call push ups, I don't want to take all of them. <laughs> Two reasons. Any idea what they are? It's a little bigger. Track. I think you got it both there. To look bigger, more important, scarier for predators or big ugly guys with cameras, whatever it is they're trying to scare away. Uh, and the other one would be to attract a mate. You know, look how tough I am. It's strong. So yeah, this one crawls along here and then he does some push-ups a couple times. It's, uh, it's a spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler. Now this one, look at the tail. I took this photo. This was right outside our nature center, probably 25 feet from our front door. Um, Mickey said this is not rare. It's, well, it's not unheard of. It's not real common, but it's not worthy of putting into a journal. In other words, it's already happened before. But this is a western fence lizard, a little bit of a mutant, I might say. I had to take a picture of that one. <coughs> Okay, now we go on to the alligator lizard. This is the biggest lizard in our area, in the San Gabriel Valley. Or, or you're probably not in the San Gabriel Valley. Are you? It's our biggest lizard. Right. Okay, that's your big Okay, this one is not taken locally here. It's too silvery. We don't get them looking like that here. Ours look more like this. This is my arm. Helen took the picture. This is what our uh, alligator look, lizards look like here, for the most part. And now this one, another video, this one I see it crawling along. It's believed that the alligator lizards are probably going to turn into snakes. Um, their legs are very short. They're no longer the long, fast-moving legs that the other lizards have. And they're, they walk along with their tongue sampling the air, kind of. And they move like this. Their heads go like this, kind of like a snake does. A snake kind of goes like this. The head moving back and forth a bit. But sometimes they do this, but uh, but as this one's moving along, it'll move up here and its head will go back and forth while it's walking. So it is believed that these are going to someday turn into snakes. Can they evolve? Yeah, when they evolve, right? Can they lose their tail also? For I oh, mean, lose it, lose. It. I thought you said use it. Yeah, well, use it and lose it. <laughs> Use it or lose it, right? Compared to most, is that like considered a really long tail? Compared to most lizards yeah. in general? Yeah, it is. Rip tail is long too. These two have the longest tails. I think so, but I'm not sure on that one. Okay, there's a close look. I got that photo. This is in the family T of the, I believe it'll say. Yeah. Western rip tail, tiger rip tail. I took that photo of the Eden Canyon. Some close live oak leaves. That is. This one I did not take, this was taken elsewhere. And this is a video of a, uh, <laughs> of a whiptail uh, digging up and then pulling out a grub and shaking his mouth. It's a great video. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> but that's what it's doing, so I actually get to see him taking the grub of some sort, shaking his mouth before eating it. That's pretty impressive. The young have <clears throat> blue tails, very pretty. I think those are Mickey's hands too. And we find those here, or even more like eating? Yeah, here. Yeah, too. Yeah, they come out when it's warmer. They like the warmer weather. So you, June, July, August, early September, you'll see them out there. When the other, other lizards are not out as often, in the heat of the day, they'll be out. Chuck, we have them here too. Good, okay. We actually, a couple years ago, caught one in the kitchen. Oh, okay. Good. Probably good in cooking, right? <laughs> and they move kind of jerky a lot of times, jerkily. You'll see them. They'll do that a lot of times. And they have long tails, like the alligator lizard. This is a whip tail. It gives you kind of an idea of the percentage of what they eat. 
depending upon what's available, of course. Uh, one thing I should have thrown in about salamanders and the newts, people buy them as pets and don't know how to take care of them, but throw bits of bread in there. Not going to work. They're kind of worse. And they'll also throw in, for salamanders, they'll throw in some dead flies. They like their food live, so they won't eat those things. Question on that subject. Yeah. You mentioned one of the slides of the lizard was a picture of it coming out of a hole that he had a red on his mouth yeah. from yeah. eating a yellow flower. Yellow, yellow, yellow. yellow. I think yeah. I said yellow. I yes, it. yellow. Oh, yellow. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, the point is, uh, do you classify these as omnivores or, or yeah. carnivores? Yeah, they're, they're, they'll eat some, some uh, small insects and things too, I believe, but mostly like Iguanas, green iguanas, they're, they're really omnivores too. They eat mostly plants, um, but they'll eat mealworms and crickets and things so like that. So they vary? A little bit. Most, I would say they're mostly uh, uh, herbivores. Yeah. Is it true that uh, some salamanders can eat the legs? Yeah. 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 Horned lizard, we, as I mentioned, we no longer have them in Eaton Canyon because they were great pets and people thought so. What they are able to do is squirt blood out of the eye at times to frighten off a predator. It's foul tasting and it startles them. They have a weak, purposely weak veil, or vein, bl blood vessel in the, in the eye that they can uh, exert pressure and squirt it out through the eye. It will be a big deterrent for a lot of animals, dogs for example. And people too, and that was uh, I think that was Mickey's hand also. He's had a, he's had a hand in this once or twice. Okay, this is one of those that doesn't have claws. <laughs> one of our reptiles that doesn't have claws. Uh, Legless lizard. I have found these occasionally in Canyon down in the stream. If you saw this and you weren't sure whether it was a lizard or a snake, how would you be able to tell? An idea? No, it's a lizard, so it has scales. They're real tiny. It's hard to tell. And this is important, Dosen's List, because this is a question that comes up on our annual Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader quiz that we do in the summer, okay? So Ooh, listen to this. And those exist in Placerita Canyon. Do they? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do. We find them occasionally. And they all love pool cry. Pool cry like being beautiful. They can be gold colored, too, kind of gold rather than this one I found. This one's silvery. But one difference between a lizard and a snake, lizards can blink, snakes cannot. Snakes have a permanent clear cover over their eyes, but they cannot blink. Lizards can. So if you were to blow in the face of this one, it might very well blink. Jack, you just said they have a permanent cover. I've seen the snake sheds, and the sheds have like a, a scale that looks like a goggle. It does. Yeah. Is there another cover uh -huh. in addition to that? No, it's just regenerating itself. Okay. It's part of the yeah. It's part of the process. Would they actually let you go up to them and blow in their in their eye? Well, I was able to hold the one in my hand, so I could have. I didn't do it because I knew what it was. Okay. And I didn't think about doing it. But if I had thought of it, I would have tried it. How big did they? Get? Oh, they're maybe this long. It came out very big. The one I had. This is a closer view of one. You can see it does have scales, they're just not prominent. They're, they live mostly underground, and, and, and so they don't need big scales, they can just catch on things. So this uh, blind snake, which we'll see, maybe next, no, not next, they have small scales. So here's a western skink, bright colors. The skinks, the youth, the young skinks have bright blue tails, the western fence lizards. I got a video of one on the trail of my phone just at the last second. Went in the brush like a little tiny spaces in there of blue that I saw still in the in the, in the picture. But Western skate can regenerate the tail. Walker Ranch, some of you should know where that is now. Uh, collared lizard, we don't have those here, they're in the desert, but I guess Mickey threw them in here because, well, they're pretty and they, they eat Western fence lizards. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, a cannibal. Well, they're a different genus, so they're not really cannibals, I guess. And I don't even think they're in the same family. I don't think they're in 
I don't think they're not in the Iguanidae family. They might be in the Teidae, I'm not sure. But they're different families, so. Okay, now we get to the snakes, and this will be the next to last group, and the last one will be the tortoise turtle. So here we have the common snakes in, in your area. I'm sure they're the same as Eaton Canyon here. Um, I took this picture, actually, it was in a terrarium, and then I just cloned out the uh, surroundings. Gopher snake. A lot of people mistake them for rattlesnakes. They do have a similar marking pattern. This was taken elsewhere, I don't know where, by somebody else. Uh, oh, it's too bad we don't have this video. This is a good one. There's actually a snake there, right in the, in the uh, bladder pod bush. But as I took the video, in, in all honesty, I saw the snake close up and then I backed up. And then I started taking the video and I walked toward it. See how long it took to see it in the video. And you have to zoom in. When you finally, well, when I first see the snake and I know it's there, you're probably seeing an area about this big in the, in the video before you can actually see the snake. So well camouflaged, but there is a gopher snake in there. And this one, this is a video of the gopher snake rattling its tail in the leaves. It sounds like a rattlesnake. It's mimicry. And that will scare a lot of people and some other animals into thinking it's a rattlesnake. It's a common uh, behavior of a gopher, of a, one of those gopher snake. Okay, this is a striped racer. People all may confuse these with garter snakes. Um, striped racer is darker than garter snake. They're almost black, dark bluish to black. Uh, I have a video of one of these too. Notice the stripe down each side, the single thin stripe down the side, on each side. The garter snake we'll see has a thick stripe on each side. Much different than this one. The this is a close-up of the striped racer. I was lucky enough to get these photos. Uh, I think, I'm trying to remember whether I took these in Bailey Canyon or not. I don't remember that pipe being there in Bailey Canyon. So now I'm not sure where I took it. It might have been in, in uh, Chantry Flats area, I'm not sure. But anyway, this is one of the rare views of, that you'll get a close-up of a racer because they do live up to their names. Um, they will eat western fence lizards. This was taken on the way up to Henninger Flats. I happened to see this one day, about 2001 or so. I didn't see it eat it, but I did see it back up this hill and disappear into the brush. Okay, this was taken at Bailey Canyon. And this is a striped racer. And this is a video. Uh, but in the video, I was going to stop it because it took off just as I got to it. And, and I was going to pause it when you see about this much of the tail left, because that's usually all you see of a racer. <laughs> you go, oh, there's a racer. Um, so if you're lucky enough to see like I did and get some good photos of it, the one I saw was probably asleep. Can't tell because they can't close their eyes when they sleep. But it stayed there and let me get close-up photos and everything. And, and it didn't move until I touched it, then it crawled away quickly. So here we have California king snake. They can be brown and yellow like this. They can also be black and white or black and yellow. Notice king snake is one word. It's, uh, they call it a king snake because it will eat rattlesnakes. It is immune to the venom. That is one of their foods. As long as the rattlesnake is a little bit smaller than they are, they can eat it. Here's a mountain king snake, which there's one right in here, I guess, right there hiding right now. Uh, looks a lot, it's another uh, mimicker. It mimics the coral snake. And I just saw an Alfred Hitchcock episode uh, two nights ago. Harry Morgan was in it. He wanted to kill his wife, so he bought what was supposed to be a coral snake to kill her because they looked like coral snakes. So he, had, he gave it to her and then he left and went away and hoping when he came back she'd be dead. And she was handling it, he was crawling on her. And it, you're okay, yeah, I'm okay. And she said, here, take it. And the snake bit him. He went, oh, no, I didn't get it. Oh, no, no, it's okay, it's just harmless. He told me it was harmless. No, no, and then he died. And I, and I thought, I saw in the video, in the movie, it was just like this. A coral snake has red on yellow, they touch. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. This one has, it's more like white rather than yellow, but 
Okay, come on. Are there mountain cakes downstairs? Yes. Yeah. And we don't really see them in Eaton Canyon. The closest I saw one was in Chantry Flats. But red on yellow, kill a fellow. Red on black, friend of Jack. Or venom black. But I kind of teach memory, and it's better if you just remember one or the other, rather than said, red on yellow, friendly fellow, <coughs> red on black, he'll kill Jack, because that's wrong. So if you just remember one of them, red on yellow, kill a fellow, he'll help. But we don't have any coral snakes in California. The closest ones are in Arizona. Uh, so it turns out that the, the snake they used, of course, in the movie was a, a, a mountain king snake. But they were okay because that's what it was supposed to be. They gave him a king snake, and Harry Morgan died of a heart attack because he thought he was going to die. He didn't die from venom. So I thought, oh, good, at least they made it correct. You know, they used the right snake for that and not pretended it really was a coral snake. Okay, garter snake. Notice it says two striped garter snake. Notice that the stripe on this is thick. It goes halfway from the side all the way down to the bottom on one side, on each side. Those are the two stripes. Lighter color, more of an olive color than a racer. They look similar otherwise. But the racer is real dark with that thin stripe. This has the two stripes, one on each side, that are thick, half the, half the height of the body. And somebody put one in our pond, and we know it's not our native one because this one has a third stripe down the back. This is a knot, not a... Uh, Thamnophis hamadai, this is some other Thamnophis, probably the same genus, different species. That's Helen's hand when I took that photo. So we knew right away that it wasn't one of our native snakes, so we knew to take it out and give it, I don't know where she took it, but she took it somewhere. She didn't kill it, I can tell you that, I know Helen. Okay, here we have a live night snake, hiding behind the record. Night snake, these are some rarer snakes that are around. And very mild venom can kill very small animals. It wouldn't hurt a human, wouldn't harm a human. Um, this is a snake that we find in the Eden Canyon. Occasionally I found one. The ring neck snake. Yeah. It does have a ring around the neck right here. You can see it on the lower photo. How it got its name. Silver leather American could have been used, I think. But on the underside, it's really bright orange and yellow. They'll, when they're threatened, they turn over and show this bright reddish color. In nature, red, bright colors usually mean danger. Think of the poison arrow frogs in, in the tropics. Bright blue, bright yellow, skunks, black and white. No camouflage there. So these turn on the underside to threaten pre frightened predators. Okay, that's the underside of one. I think that was the photo I took. Black-headed snake, they exist. I've not seen one in Eaton Canyon. 